You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more huddled masses yearning to breathe consider free, consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 15. We are coming to you this week from the Rail Splitter Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. With a steady hand on the tiller, as always, our calm, cool, and collected executive producer is Lulu Spencer. And me? You can learn more about me this podcast and our guests at our website in the past lane.com and on Facebook and Twitter where my handle is in the past lane and we hope you'll take a minute to zip on over to iTunes or wherever you access this podcast to leave a review and a rating ratings and reviews really help people so thanks okay you know what season it is no I'm not talking about baseball season or reading trashy novels on the beach season, or let's make a half-assed attempt at a vegetable garden season. Although I, I am a big fan of all three. No, I'm talking about convention season. Political conventions, that is. Yes, this week, the Republican Party, the GOP, gathers in Cleveland, Ohio, to nominate candidates for president and vice president of the United States. Then next week, it's the Democrats' turn in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. So this week, in episode 15, In the Past Lane takes a look at the history of the Republican Party. I sit down with historian Heather Cox Richardson, author of a superb history of the Republican Party. She'll take us on a fascinating journey through times when the GOP was the party of big business in Wall Street and when it periodically shifted to become the party of the people and the common good. Next week, given the history about to be made at the Democratic National Convention, Regarding Hillary Clinton's nomination, In the Past Lane, episode 16 dives into the history of women in politics. I'll talk with historian Ellen Fitzpatrick about her new book, The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency. Okay, people, time to turn off NPR, because your journey in the past lane begins now. In just a few minutes, you'll hear my interview with Heather Cox Richardson about the history of the Republican Party. To set that up, let's do a little GOP 101. Where did the Republican Party come from? One way to explain its origins is to delve into the story of one of its earliest members. That story begins in the spring of 1854, when Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This act was the latest of many compromises over the issue of slavery. Previous important ones being, of course, the U.S. Constitution, the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and the Compromise of 1850. Now, some Americans, largely those in the South and those who favored slavery, they were thrilled at the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But elsewhere, especially in the North, many reacted with rage. One of these people was a middle-aged man from the Midwest. In 1854, he was enjoying life as a wealthy corporate lawyer. He had dabbled in politics back in the 1840s, but he now seemed pretty content with his life as a lawyer. But the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act convinced him he needed to re-enter politics. He wasn't a radical abolitionist like William Lloyd Garrison, but he was thoroughly anti-slavery. Like a lot of Northerners who, like him, were members of the Whig Party, he was adamantly opposed to the spread of slavery into the Western territories. This lawyer and his fellow Northern Whigs believed that slavery 
was just incompatible with the nation's founding ideals of all men are created equal and that all are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were committed to keeping slavery confined to the American South, where it would, they believed, eventually die out. But the Kansas-Nebraska Act seemed to threaten that plan. It repealed the Missouri Compromise and opened the possibility that slavery could spread to the Kansas and Nebraska territories and beyond. If this occurred, this lawyer believed that slavery would be strengthened instead of dying out. And if that happened, the great contradiction of allowing slavery in a republic of liberty would endure for many more generations. And this was simply intolerable, and the time had come for action. And so our Midwestern lawyer decided to re-enter politics. Seeking a nomination from his state for the U.S. Senate, he gave a series of speeches on the Nebraska crisis. In each of them, he made clear his opposition to the spread of slavery. Of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he said, I cannot but hate it. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. Ultimately, this lawyer-turned-office-seeker failed in this attempt to win a seat in the U.S. Senate. But by then, his beloved Whig party had collapsed, a victim of the divisive slavery issue. In the South, most Whigs joined the Democratic Party, the party staunchly committed to protecting and promoting slavery. In the North, the death of the Whig party presented a monumental question. What party would emerge to replace the once venerable Whig party? Well, there was one emerging party that many people thought had a great shot to replace the Whigs. It was the American Party, better known as the Know-Nothing Party, and it was dedicated to ridding America of the scourge of immigrants, especially Irish Catholics. But our lawyer? He wanted nothing to do with these bigoted nativists. He understood that the greatest threat to the Republic was not immigration from Europe, but rather slaveholders in the South and their political allies in the North. And so, our lawyer made common cause with like-minded former Whigs who began to gravitate towards small grassroots parties that were emerging with names like Anti-Nebraska Party, the People's Party, the Republican Party. Ultimately, that last name, Republican Party, began to stick. Just two years later, in 1856, this new Republican Party held a convention in Philadelphia and nominated the famed explorer John C. Fremont for president. And our lawyer? He was there for the whole event. Indeed, his name was entered as a possible candidate for Fremont's vice president. He generated some support among delegates, but finished second in the balloting. Two years later, however, he garnered national headlines as a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. And two years after that, well, by now you probably know the rest. In the summer of 1860, this Illinois lawyer named Abraham Lincoln was nominated by the Republican Party for President of the United States. Okay, that's enough background on the origins of the Republican Party. In a minute, you'll hear an interview I conducted with historian Heather Cox Richardson about the history of the Republican Party. Stay tuned, people. You're about to have some fascinating political history dropped on you. You are listening to In the Past Land the podcast about history and why it matters. Okay, we're back. With me now is Heather Cox Richardson. She is professor of history at Boston College. She is the author of many books, including West from Appomattox, The Reconstruction of America After the Civil War, Wounded Knee, Party Politics and the Road to an American Massacre, and most recently, To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party. And since it's political convention season, that's the book we want to talk about today. Heather Cox Richardson, thank you for joining us today at In the Past Lane. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's get started. I think in this case, we want to start off really from the beginning when talking about the Republican Party with the convention looming. So maybe you can get us started with talking about the origins of the party and some of the key ideals and values that formed that party back in the 1850s. Well, and one of the things that I find fascinating about the Republican Party is that it really echoes America. It really is the story of America as well as the story of the Republican Party. And here's why. What the Republicans really do is they articulate the vision of America that was put together in the Declaration of Independence. 
And they do it to stand against the slave power, as they called it. A group, a very small group, about 1% of the American population, a very small group of elite white men who believed that the only correct way to run a society was for people like themselves to run it and to run it in such a way that they protected property. And what the Republicans saw is that if that idea held, if you let those men control society and you let them make the laws, gradually they would come to dominate the economy, society, and politics, and the idea of American democracy would die. So the Republican Party forms in 1854 and then really takes off in 1856 and 1858, and then, of course, they win the election in 1860 very quickly for a fledgling party. And their idea is very different than that of the slave owners. Their idea is that the genius of America is that it is a land of equality of opportunity where every individual has the opportunity to rise. And that's an opportunity that they believe is promised in the Declaration of Independence. So in a way, the Democrats become the representatives in a sense of the Constitution. But what the Republicans are is the great principled vision of what democracy could be. It really could be equality of opportunity for all. And when they go to war in 1860, and when they talk about holding the country out of the hands of the slave power, they're really not arguing about small issues. They are arguing about the nature of American democracy, whether or not it can survive, and whether or not democracy really is going to be a viable system of government across the world. When Abraham Lincoln calls America the last best hope of Earth, he's not being rhetorical. He is really saying this is where democracy and the idea of equality either stands or falls here in America in the 1850s and the 1860s. It's a very exciting and important moment, not only in American history, but also in world history. Yeah, and I think that one thing that comes out in reading antebellum literature, whether it's politicians or people you've never heard of, is the, the phrase, the Republican experiment. I think that's such an important thing to, to emphasize, and Lincoln certainly says it several times, because it suggests that it's an experiment that could easily go awry at any moment, and that it needs to be guarded and protected, and it needs to be somehow protected. In some ways, that's one of the notions, it seems to me, that underlies what the Republicans are up to in the 1850s, trying to protect the republic from being hijacked, so to speak. Trying to protect it from being hijacked governmentally by this small elite group of people who believe that the only way a good society works is by hierarchies. And, you know, that it really has been the Western way in their experience for centuries, that a few educated, wealthy white men direct everybody else because the other people aren't competent to run their own lives. And so there is partly defending it against the government against that other idea. But there is also the idea really of pushing worldwide the idea of human self-determination. You know, after the 1848 revolutions, a lot of these movements died. And what they're really arguing is that human beings should have the right to determine their own futures. And that is a very different way of looking at the world than had been previously embraced in the West. And it's one that I just find very moving because the people who are talking about it, and yes, there are lots of caveats. They're not including women. They're not including Indians. They're not including many different people of color. But it is a principle. It is an idea that could be expanded. And more than that, it is an idea that they were literally willing not only to die for themselves, but to send their sons to die for and to send their sons to kill for. And that's a really extraordinary moment in human history. So when we talk about the Republican Party and, you know, nowadays you sort of think of the apparatus and you think of the politicians and you think of sort of the, you know, the mechanics of it. And you forget that there was truly blood and principle in the early years. Yeah. And I think you get that when you look at a figure like Lincoln, who's very conscious of his role in guiding the Republic through this incredibly difficult, trying moment of the Civil War. And he does reference, as you say, in really what the cornerstone speech, one of the cornerstone speeches of his tenure in office, which is the Gettysburg Address, and the founding document that he decides he chooses to quote is the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. And that's a very important moment when he says, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Because with that, he redefines America, which was founded, in fact, legally with the Constitution and with the ratification of the Constitution. 
And that's what the slave owners had always stood on, the three-fifths clause, the protection of property, the idea that they should be able to garner support and take over the government. He says, no, that's not really what America is about. America really is about equality of opportunity. And that's why the Gettysburg Address, which is you know, so famous and such a short little speech, but why it is so famous, because it's with that speech, he really rededicates America, not to the idea of a republic, if you will, that can be hijacked by the very wealthy to recreate the same sort of system that has stood in Europe for so long, but rather that America is going to be about equality of opportunity for all. And that is what people are fighting and dying for. It's a very important moment, and he is very aware of it. And you have to wonder if there is any other person we can think of in our history who could have literally rededicated the country and redefined what the country meant. That was in, you know, in, the, in the middle of the war. Yeah, citing it as a new birth of freedom. So with that in mind, this raises a question that just, let's say, 20 years later, even shorter than that, we're not so much defining, or many people wouldn't define the Republican Party as this party of equal opportunity for all. In some ways, it seems to become, in the Gilded Age, that 20, 30-year period after the Civil War, as the party of laissez-faire and kind of radical individualism of a different sort and great hostility towards the labor movement. So how does that, is that an accurate depiction and how does that happen? It is. And the story of how it happens is in those early years, the earlier incarnation is really a story that we have lived with ever since. Because what happens is the Republicans start with this ideology I'm talking about, that they're going to stand against the slave power and the hierarchical society that it represents. But they don't really know what they're going to do with that. It's a lovely thought, but really all they're doing is they're standing against something. And then they get Lincoln gets elected and the Southern states secede. So what they do when they walk out is they hand the Congress over to the Republicans who have no clue what they're going to do with it. And what they do with it during the war very quickly is they start by having to raise money to fight the war, and the Treasury has no money. So it has to start raising money. And very quickly, Congress turns from raising money through traditional sources, it almost immediately begins to levy national taxation. It's actually the Republicans during the Civil War who invent our national taxes, including the income tax. Everybody thinks it's the Democrats in 1913. It's not. It's the Republicans in 1861. What they do is they begin to raise national taxes, and they begin then to realize that if people are going to pay national taxes, not just the income tax, but also manufacturing taxes, that if people are going to pay those taxes, they must have enough money to pay them. So what the Republican Party does very quickly, beginning in 1862, is they begin to use the federal government to enable men on the make, people at the bottom of society, to rise. They pass the Homestead Act, which gives land to people where they can have farms and they can produce goods for sale. They pass the Land-Grant College Act, also in 1862, which is designed to let poor men get education, which is a wildly radical idea. Previously, higher education was limited generally to people whose fathers were very wealthy and could pay for their private tutoring or could pay for their trips to elite colleges. They're passing a transcontinental railroad to get people out to the mines into the West and to Western farms. They do a number of things to use the federal government to enable individuals to rise. And of course, ultimately, by 1865, they're going to be using the power of the federal government to enable African-Americans to rise by ending slavery once and for all. So what you have under the Republicans, the congressional Republicans and Lincoln during the Civil War is an expansion of the powers of the federal government to make it possible for individuals to rise in American society without regard to their initial condition in life, their race, or whether or not they're poor. Now, this is largely limited to men, of course, but that's the idea is the government is going to enable people to rise. Well, that's a, an extraordinarily popular thing to do. By 1865, Lincoln's government is extraordinarily popular. But there are a number of people who don't like it, who don't like the idea that the government is going to be using tax dollars to help poor men, but also to help African Americans, as it does during Reconstruction. And what happens quickly is there is a backlash, starting among Democrats in the South, but then getting picked up by Democrats in the North, in which they argue that this whole idea of a government that helps individuals is really a smokescreen for what they call a redistribution of wealth. And what they say is that for the government to have the organization it's going to need to 
protect African Americans especially, but also to administer the colleges, for example, it's going to need to use tax dollars. And those tax dollars are by definition going to have to come from people who have money. And almost always that is going to be white people. So what they begin to say is that an activist government that promotes equality of opportunity is a redistribution of wealth from hardworking white people to lazy African Americans. That the idea of an activist government that helps people is actually a redistribution of wealth, usually from white to black. Now, I emphasize that because that should sound familiar. That construction has haunted American history ever since. But what happens is the Republicans begin to embrace that idea, not because they have anything against African Americans in the South in the 1860s, but because workers in New York are controlling the city of New York, and the city of New York is crucial for reasons that have to do with the Electoral College to winning the White House. And Republicans begin to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this whole idea of equality and everybody being equal really isn't such a good thing that you don't really want people at the bottom to have a say in society and to use the government for their own good, because what they're doing is they're controlling New York City. And as a result, they're threatening Republican control of the White House. So by the 1870s, you get this backlash against the idea of an activist government helping everybody to rise based on the idea that that sort of an activist government redistributes wealth from wealthy people to poor people, usually black people and immigrants. And the Republican Party ties itself at that point to Wall Street and to big business. So by the mid-1870s, the Republican Party still talks about equality. But what they really are pushing is the idea that no longer that if people at the bottom do well in society, everybody will do well in society. Now they are pushing the idea that if people at the top do well, wealth will trickle down to people at the bottom. Party ties itself to big business, and by the 1880s, 1890s, we have sort of a gilded age, robber baron idea of the Republican Party. Ideologically, they sound a lot alike, but they operate entirely differently. And after that happens, we get an economic crash. As wealth rises once again up to the very top of society, up to probably about the top 1% again, we get an economic crash in 1893. And that's a pattern. The idea of the government expanding and becoming active to expand equality of opportunity, there being a racist and xenophobic backlash against that, saying that it redistributes tax dollars from white people to immigrants or people of color, then the party tying itself to big business, and then there being an economic crash, has repeated itself three times in American history once under Lincoln, beginning with Lincoln, once beginning with Theodore Roosevelt, and once beginning with Dwight Eisenhower. And right now, we're at the end of that third cycle. And I would predict we're looking at the beginning of the fourth coming up. But that's how it comes that the Republican Party goes from being this progressive, expansive party, advancing equality of opportunity, within almost a decade or two, becoming the party of the very wealthy. And that happens again and again. Yeah, it's a very interesting transformation. You also see the sort of use of the same terms, too, about freedom, about opportunity and all, but it's a very different construction of it in reality when you get to the Gilded Age, where they're talking about freedom of contract as opposed to policies that would help the average worker rise from pretty grim circumstances. So that's the Gilded Age. And you already mentioned Theodore Roosevelt. He, in some ways, is an accidental president. He's the vice president. There's an interesting story behind his selection as vice president. But then he becomes, at McKinley's assassination in 1901, he becomes president and inaugurates, in some ways, a return to those founding principles. That's exactly right. And there's, there's two interesting things for the modern era about Teddy Roosevelt becoming a president. The first that people always ask about is, when did liberal come to mean using an activist government? You know, previously in the 19th century, the idea of being a liberal meant that you believed in a very small government that, in fact, did not impede any kind of individualism. That the real fear was that a strong government would hurt an individual, would hurt an individual's ability to rise. And now, in the beginning of the 21st century, liberal means somebody who believes in a big government that actually intervenes in a lot of ways in people's lives. So when did that transition happen? That transition happened with Teddy Roosevelt in his era, and he was part of it. There were a number of people who were. And the argument was, at the time, Teddy Roosevelt is taking on the 
extremes of industrialization, the extremes of wealth, the terrible conditions in factories, the extraordinary poverty in urban areas and in the plain states. And what he argues and what Republicans argue in the 19 aughts is that for an individual truly to be free, truly to have self-determination, the government must get involved to curb the power of industry and to promote education and health and clean up the cities. So the idea of being a liberal, of promoting individualism, paradoxically, in the progressive era becomes the idea that the government must be involved in individuals' lives in order to enable individuals to have freedom. So that's one place that Roosevelt administration is really interesting for today because of that switch in the meaning of the word liberal. But it's also really interesting for today because, as you say, Teddy Roosevelt becomes president accidentally when McKinley is assassinated. And he is put in the vice presidency really to get rid of him. The party bosses don't like him and they don't like his, what they consider radical ideas, his progressive ideas. He actually doesn't start very radical. They push him toward radicalism. But the reason I'm finding him fascinating today is that Teddy Roosevelt really cuts his teeth in the 1884 election that nobody remembers nowadays. And it's an election where the Republicans nominated James G. Blaine, the senator from Maine, you know, that ditty, Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, continental liar from the state of Maine. And many Republicans couldn't stomach Blaine, who was seen as being extraordinarily corrupt. So they jump the party and they vote for a Democrat, Grover Cleveland. But Teddy Roosevelt was one of the people who simply could not stomach voting for a Democrat. He couldn't do it. He was not a Democrat. So he stays in the Republican Party, and he and a number of other quite young men start to pay attention to the Republican Party's machinery and to say, this is not the Republican Party that we want to belong to. This party that is funneling money upward, that works for the trust, that works for wealthy people and for big business. We want to go back to the Lincoln model. And no one's paying much attention to them in 1884, but they are, for example, Henry Cabot Lodge, Teddy Roosevelt, Albert Beveridge, Robert La Follette. All of them cut their teeth in 1884, staying with the party, but saying, because they say we're not Democrats, but saying this Republican Party that works for the rich is not our Republican Party. And of course, by 1900, those very men are not young men anymore, and they're running the party, and they're taking it back to its original principles very self-consciously. So Roosevelt is a really interesting moment for us right now, because I think in many ways, today's Republican Party and today's convention looks a lot like the convention of 1884, where some people will jump the Republican Party to vote for a Democrat, but other young men and women that we don't know yet, that we don't see yet, will stay with the party and say, we cannot take the party into the 21st century the way it is now. And in 20 years, we will be looking at a very different Republican Party. So you're saying that that's a distinct possibility, that there is a reform effort under the radar, so to speak, that's happening within the Republican Party that might act to steer it in a different direction that might, you know, guarantee its survival into the future of the 21st century. I'd put money on it. Yeah, you certainly do hear of voices, people trying to say we can't continue to do things the way we're doing, whether it's the questions of taxes or race or just the functioning of the government. So that that is an interesting historical moment in the early 20th century that, or the late 19th century that uh, may indeed have a parallel in our era. All right, it's time to take a short break. But don't go anywhere, people. This journey in the past lane is not complete. When we return, Heather Cox Richardson will pick up the fascinating story of the Republican Party after the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Thanks. 
So Roosevelt is, as you say, so crucial, and he's a very interesting figure in so many uh, different ways. And I think that that point that you make about liberalism really is is important. The way I often talk about it with my students is to say that Roosevelt and others discovered that freedom isn't just the opportunity to do things, that there are material conditions that ensure Republican freedom. That if you're free but starving, you're not really free. You're not really a Republican citizen. Or if you live in a squalid tenement that your children are all going to get tuberculosis and die. You're not really a, a free citizen of a republic. And I think that underlies some of that thinking by the early 20th century, what we call you know, the progressive era. I think that's right. And one of the fun things that we never really talk about is, in a way, what the first incarnation of the Republican Party under Lincoln was doing is it was trying to adjust democracy to westward expansion, which was a huge change in American society. In the Roosevelt era, the progressive Republicans were really trying to adjust democracy to industrialization, which was a huge problem. Nobody quite knew what to do with the extremes of wealth and preventing the extremes of wealth and having a society that remained coherent. There's a lot of different ways people approach trying to fix that, but Roosevelt provided a political way. And then you could argue that Eisenhower, when he did a very similar construction of the government, was really trying to come to grips with an international world, and an international world that had to deal with the threat of nuclear weapons. All three of those moments were moments when democracy had to be redefined. And the Republican Party was lucky enough, and believe me, it made a lot of mistakes on the way, but it was lucky enough to find people who could redefine democracy in such a way that it could absorb these new dramatic changes and still retain the central principle of human self-determination. Eisenhower is also a very interesting figure in a different way from Roosevelt. He, when he's bandied about as a potential candidate in the late 40s, early 50s, the, the question everybody asks is, well, what party does he belong to? And he eventually decides that he's a Republican. But if you look at the leading figures in the party, Taft and some of the others, they are in many ways hoping that the next Republican will dismantle the New Deal or many parts of it. And Eisenhower is surprising to them and to many other people as well. Yeah, and in fact, I think we're still living with the fallout from the rise of Eisenhower in that the movement conservatives who now control the Republican Party, their driving principle was always to dismantle the New Deal. And they were trying to dismantle it because they hated the idea of government intervention in the economy and of government regulation of business. They're quite articulate about that in the early days, that they cannot stand the idea that the government should tell them how much to pay their workers, for example. So I think we're still dealing with the fallout of that. But Eisenhower is a really interesting character, and for sure the man made mistakes, but he lived in terror of the idea of nuclear war. After living through World War II, what that taught him after he was one of the first people on site at a concentration camp was that human beings, given the wrong, if you will, provocation, will turn on each other like savages. And he came to believe over time that what was crucially important for world leaders was to guarantee that those conditions never existed, to stop those conditions from happening. And what he believed was that you had to worry less about the rise of dictators than you had to worry about the construction of a population that would follow a dictator. So that rather than looking at the rise of Hitler and Mussolini, what you really need to look at was how a society created a disaffected population that was ready to follow a megalomaniac who would promise them the moon, but they absolutely couldn't deliver. And he came to believe that cultural or political dispossession would upset enough people that they would follow anybody who could promise to return to some past that they considered the good old days. And that person would rise by promising that the whole problem that these dispossessed people faced had been caused by one particular group. It's a very clear rhetoric. And Eisenhower followed a philosopher named Eric Hoffer, who wrote a book called True Believer in the 1950s, in which he said, the way you create this disaffected population is to convince them that people who are falling behind economically or culturally, that their problems are not that they're out of step with society or that the laws are somehow discriminating against them, but rather that it's the fault of a specific group of people. And who that group of people is doesn't really matter, so long as they can turn their hatred towards something. And gradually, as they dehumanize that group of people, 
the more they dehumanize them, the more they will dehumanize them and blame them for more and more because only by dehumanizing them can they, the perpetrators, defend their treatment of them in the first place. And what you get then is a person, it's a group of people who is ripe for a dictator to come in and take over. So Eisenhower was adamant that humans, not just Americans, but humans across the globe needed to have rising standards of living and should not live under totalitarian governments because he was either communist or fascist. People forget he also fought fascist because he was determined not to create that kind of a population and leave the world open for religious extremism or political extremism to getting their hands on a nuclear weapon. And if you think about his predictions and his fears, they were remarkably prescient. They really were. Well, the one we hear about all the time is his reference to the military-industrial complex. But is there anything in particular you're citing where he warns against the specter of, you know, the kinds of conditions that create dictators? Yes. There's a couple of places, but the military-industrial complex is a really interesting one because he originally wanted to include the word congressional in that as well, because he said, once we start developing a permanent military, which of course was a new thing after World War II, what you're going to get is Congress people who are wedded to contracts coming their way, and they will be committed to militarizing because it's the only way to continue to get money for their districts. And that was what he was really against. And he's actually the source of that very famous quotation that showed up in the 1970s, and everybody thought it was anti-Vietnam protesters who said it. It was actually Eisenhower who talked about how every warship built meant six less schools. I don't have the exact numbers there, but his point was that if we poured money into the military, we would not be able to guarantee everybody a rising standard of living, which he believed was the only way to, to stop there being another war. But yes, he actually talks a lot about his fears of dispossessed populations, and he talks about them in his private letters and in his diaries. There's a wonderful letter he wrote to a veteran who wrote him a very angry letter and said, you know, you need to stop trying to explain things to people. You need to just, just tell us what to think. We need a strong leader. We want to just know what to think, and we'll follow you. And that's, you know, that's really how you're going to keep America safe in this terribly dangerous time. And Eisenhower took the time to write this man a very long, very thoughtful letter in which he said, easy answers are too easy. The whole point of democracy and of self-determination, although well, that's my word and not his, the whole point of democracy is that we have to deal with ambiguity. We have to deal with hard questions. And we cannot let leaders tell us how to think. Your job is to critically evaluate what is happening in the world around you and what people are saying to you, not to follow a leader. And then he recommended that the man read Hoffer's book. It's a wonderful letter. It's a very interesting worldview. He's in a very, very tense period because there's a Cold War and he's a military man. So he believes in a strong military, but not to the point where it turns us into something that we wouldn't recognize, that it would undermine basic small R Republican values. Precisely. And he was terrified of the extraordinary amount of money going into the military because, remember, he's the last Republican to actually balance a budget. Uh, it's worth remembering. He also believed in fiscal responsibility, and he recognized full well in a way that the early movement conservatives refused to acknowledge, for example, in Conscience of a Conservative that came out under Barry Goldwater's name, although it was actually ghostwritten by Albert Bazell. You know, he says, we got to pour money into the military and cut taxes. And that's an equation that has never worked. Eisenhower recognized that it couldn't work, and he was terrified of pouring too much money into the military because he recognized that it would inhibit Americans' ability to create rising standards of education and living here in America, but also abroad, because, he, again, he was terrified of their becoming huge disaffected populations who were economically failing or culturally failing and who would then follow religious or political dictators. And then, of course, this is precisely what has happened in the late 20th century and early 21st. Yeah, indeed. Well, before we get to you know, our current moment, maybe we need to talk a little bit about Ronald Reagan, because he's another key figure in the story of the Republican Party. And in some ways, he embodies some of Eisenhower's qualities. But in other ways, he, you know, when it comes to taxes and the military, is also quite different. How do, where do we put Reagan in this story of the Republican Party and the direction in which it's headed? Well, Ronald Reagan is obviously a crucial figure. And it's important to remember that Ronald Reagan is an early movement conservative. 
He really signs on to Barry Goldwater. That's when he really hits national prominence is when he gives his very famous television speech called The Time for Choosing. He signs on to movement conservatism and the idea that the government should roll back the New Deal and should do absolutely nothing but promote individual enterprise, as they call it, although really that means letting business people do whatever they want, which means big business is going to become extraordinarily powerful, and promoting Christianity. He's on board with that ideologically from the very, very beginning. He's one of the early subscribers to William F. Buckley Jr.'s National Review, which is the mouthpiece of movement conservatism. And ideologically, he is absolutely on board with that. Now, what he brings to the movement, though, that it has not had before, is that sort of gentle, folksy, nice voice and the anecdotes. I mean, Democrats were operating on statistics. He would say, well, you know, most people want government out of their lives. And he'd tell these folksy stories and people would get behind it and it would sound so nice in a way that the movement conservatives had never sounded nice before. But ideologically, that is absolutely what he is up to. And that's the Ronald Reagan that today's movement conservatives, like Ted Cruz, for example, Revere, the man who spoke so harshly and so ideologically. But he did not govern that way. I mean, that's what's so interesting about Reagan is that you can be a movement conservative and say, look at this quotation, look at this quotation. This is everything he believed in. We need another Ronald Reagan. And then you can also be a Democrat looking at Ronald Reagan and saying, wait a minute, he raised taxes. What was it, 11 times? Yeah. You know, he compromised. You know, he talked a hard line, but he actually was much less harsh than his rhetoric would otherwise indicate. So I think ideologically he was a movement conservative, but he was in a moment where Americans were not ready for that kind of actual government. And he governed very differently. Now, that being said, I get into a fight with a friend about this a lot because I do believe it's the Reagan revolution that put in place the tools to give us the government we have today with the idea that any kind of taxation by definition is anti-American and that the government really should simply promote the military and big business. And that really comes out of Reagan. He's the one who slashes taxes at the same time the deficit spending for the military triples. I mean, it blows the budget wide open. He is an early supporter of Grover Norquist, who becomes the real anti-tax guru despite the fact he's never held an elected office, despite all the power he has now. He was a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce. He has never held an elected office. But he manages to pull evangelicals and a number of different groups behind the idea that any kind of taxation is a redistribution of wealth from hardworking white Americans to grasping minorities usually, but also women. And that really takes off during the Reagan years. He governed pragmatically, but his ideology and the way that ideology played out in the larger contours of his tax cuts really set the stage for where we are today. It's interesting because many of the people who worked for Reagan originally have turned against the whole idea of what they did in those years and said, you know, look, supply side economics never worked. You know, we use that magic asterisk to say it would work in the future, but it has never worked. And now economists are finally admitting that it has never worked. So Reagan is a crucial figure, both ideologically, but also in that despite the fact he himself governed somewhat pragmatically, he set up a system that was going to give us the present, which is really a dysfunctional Congress and a, and a budgeting system that doesn't work. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but would, would you say that Reagan sort of said things that he wouldn't have actually carried out fully? You know, he gave the idea that he would have shut down the government if that was necessary, but he probably would never have done it. Yet, the rhetoric and the idea of shutting down the government or abolishing an entire cabinet, you know, the Department of Education, it's people like Newt Gingrich a few years later who take those ideas and take them 100% seriously, it seems, and in fact do begin to try to enact those kinds of things that bring us to where we are today. Absolutely. When Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House, it's, there's a fascinating month or so where all the people who are part of the Gingrich Revolution are happily giving interviews to reporters. And those quotations are all in there and they have never been challenged. And nobody says, oh, they, I was misquoted. And they say, listen, our plan is to end taxation altogether and to get rid of all these social programs, that social programs are actually terrible for poor people because it makes them dependent. 
And, you know, Grover Norquist says, you know, I'm not trying to run the train. I'm trying to go further up the tracks and blow the tracks up so that the government will cease to exist. It should not do anything that it has taken on since the New Deal. I mean, they're really trying to get rid of the New Deal. And there's that moment when they're actively talking about those things and being honest about them. It's really quite illuminating that they really are ideologically driven. And it's one thing actually that comes out of movement conservatism. You know, one of the things that is in the Goldwater document, The Conscience of a Conservative, is he says, you know, I plan to make my constituents unhappy. You know, I want to cut their programs. I don't care if they like them or not. It's bad for them. And the reason I make these comments is because I think in a way it takes us full circle back to those same ideas that the initial Republican Party rose to stand against. And that's the idea that a small group of wealthy white men know what's good for the country, and they're the ones who get to decide what is the right activity for the federal government and what is not. The same way that the slave owners could say, you know, we don't care if 100% of Americans want there to be rivers and harbors bills, we're not going to do it because it's bad for the country. That's kind of the same thing that you got really quite articulately with beginning really with the Gingrich Revolution. And then now, of course, you've actually got politicians today actually saying that. And that whole idea, in a way, brings us kind of full circle back to the idea that really to run a society right, you got to have a few leaders who know what they're doing because the mass of Americans really don't understand what's best for them and what's best for the country. It is an interesting and kind of eerie in some ways, full circle. Well, by way of sort of rounding off here and and finishing up, your book came out in 2014, which uh, was not that long ago, but in political history, it seems like a really long time ago. So I'm wondering if you could have envisioned in this history of the Republican Party another chapter that would have had Donald Trump in it. I mean, could you have imagined in 2014 the emergence of a figure like Donald Trump and bringing the Republican Party to the point that it's at right now? Well, what's interesting about Donald Trump is I did see and I actually did predict that the movement conservatives were going to crash and burn as they have. And I predicted their language as well, because it was quite clear where that was going. But what's interesting about Donald Trump is, in a way, he's an entirely new figure in American society, because Donald Trump is not a politician, despite the fact he's in politics. Donald Trump is a salesman. And what's fascinating about him to me is that he is reflecting what Americans, a certain group of Americans, want to hear. So he's using the language of movement conservatism, but he is also bringing up their very real anger at the fact that the policies of the movement conservatives have really destroyed them economically since 1980. And all the charts, if you look at how wealth has moved upward since 1980, we actually have been in the midst of an extraordinary redistribution of wealth. It's just been upward rather than downward for all the fact that Republicans have talked about it going the other way. So here's this moment where you can look at a political system in a sense, not necessarily falling apart, but the actual revolt against it, because he's so wonderful at reading his audience and saying, well, right now, you know, they want to hear about you know, the fact I'm going to cut taxes for them. In fact, his actual policies would would not do anything for regular people. It would actually put a ton of money, even more money up at the top of the scale. But so he's a fascinating moment because he's not that politician. He's a salesman and he's showing us a snapshot of where the Republican Party has gone. And in that he is unique. So could I have seen him coming? No. Could I have seen somebody like him? It was my sense that the movement conservatives had prepared a population for the rise of some sort of figure who took on authoritarian tones in this cycle. Absolutely. I was much more afraid that it was going to be Ted Cruz than that it was going to be Donald Trump. I thought Trump would do very well, but I thought he would get bored and drop out. And I actually still think that's the case. I don't think even if he gets a nomination, I would be shocked if he goes all the way to the election. I don't believe he's going to do that. I think he's going to drop out. Well, he would then indeed be making history. So we'll have to wait and see in this very (laughs) wild election season, see if there's more wildness around the corner. Well, Heather, thank you so much. This has been great to talk to you about the history of the Republican Party and your book. It's a great book, and I encourage everyone to pick it up as in some ways a illuminating manual for trying to figure out the long history of the Republican Party as we head towards the conventions and eventually the general election. So, Heather, thank you so much for joining us. 
It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Heather Cox Richardson is professor of history at Boston College. Much of her work as a scholar focuses on the evolution of political ideology in American history, especially in the period from the Civil War to 1900. She examines issues of race, economics, class formation and conflict, and westward expansion. She is currently working on an intellectual history of American politics, as well as a graphic treatment of the Reconstruction era. Heather also writes articles that analyze issues in contemporary U.S. society in light of history at places like Salon, The Huffington Post, and the really cool blog, wearehistory.org. That's W-E-R-E-H-I-S-T-O-R-Y dot org. You can learn more about Heather Cox Richardson at the show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com forward slash episode 015. Hey, people, two things. First, if you'd like to learn more about the anti-slavery cause that led to the founding of the Republican Party, check out In the Past Lane, episode number four. It's all about the abolitionist movement. Also, don't forget, next week, with an eye towards the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, In the Past Lane takes a look at the history of women who, long before Hillary Clinton, ran for the office of President of the United States. people we have come to the end of the line many thanks for tuning in we hope you found this episode thought-provoking as well as entertaining if that's the case we hope you'll follow us on facebook twitter and instagram and that you'll use those platforms to leave us your comments questions and suggestions want to know more about the topics we've discussed in this episode then check out the show page for this episode at our website in the There you'll find show notes, links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to everything we've talked about in this episode. InThePastLane.com also has information about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors. And people, you know the deal. It really helps the In The Past Lane podcast when loyal listeners like you subscribe to it at iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, please leave a review. They are so helpful in bringing in new listeners. We rely on many outstanding people to bring you the In the Past Lane podcast. They include technical advisors Holly Hunt and Jesse Anderson, podcasting consultant Daryl Darnell of Pro Podcast Solutions, photographer John Buckingham, graphic designer Maggie Salucci, website by ERI Design, legal services by Tippa Canoe and Tyler Two, social media via The Pony Express, risk assessment by Little Bighorn Associates, and growth strategies handled by 5440 or fight. And of course, we'd be nowhere without executive producer Lulu Spencer. Special thanks also to Jay Graham for creating the intro music for this podcast and to the free music archive for providing the rest of the music for this episode. I'm in the past lanes host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, what's on your mind? This studio smells like Warren G. Harding's butt. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 